This is RTV6 News at 11, working for you. A different type of protest in Indy today. We'll show you how the Black Lives Matter movement and Pride Month joined forces. And open for business once again. A major part of the entertainment scene tries to make a comeback following a long COVID-19 layoff. Thanks for joining us here at 11 o'clock. I'm Nicole Griffin. We begin first here at 11 with your Storm Team 6 forecast. Meteorologist Todd Clausen standing by. And Todd, you are tracking some changes as we head into Father's Day. Yeah, and some of those changes already arriving in western portions of the state, Nicole, and that change is rain returning uh, to the forecast. If you've been out this evening, you can tell the humidity has already come up. This is after a high temperature of uh, 91 degrees earlier in the day. And look at these storms now and some heavier rain uh, making their way towards Delphi, Monticello, up towards Lafayette. There's a, another downpour that's just north of Terre Haute. So as we go throughout the overnight hours, uh, we will deal with some showers and storms first, mainly in northern and western locations. And then we'll likely see a few downpours throughout the overnight hours across all of central Indiana. But we are not expecting any severe weather. That is uh, the good news. But tomorrow, a little better chance of maybe a stronger storm or two. As you can see, the rain moving through for your Father's Day. So you may have to alter your plans just a little bit. Uh, with that, I wouldn't cancel them as of yet. Just know there will be storms possible. But otherwise, it is a warm and muggy day with a high temperature up to 85. We'll talk more about not only tomorrow, but look ahead uh, to the rest of next week coming up in just a few minutes. Nicole. Tom, thank you. The protests that have continued almost daily for more than three weeks continued today. One demonstration brought together the Black Lives Matter movement with people observing Pride Month. Today's event on Meridian Street focused on violence impacting the black LGBTQ community. They want to make sure their concerns are heard in the midst of all the new nationwide focus on racism. As we're talking about black lives, that we're acknowledging and recognize our trans community um, that has suffered over and over again prior to this year. So I just want to make sure that I'm with the people. At the event today, there was a spot on site for people to register to vote. All of the money raised today will benefit Indiana Pride of Color and Indiana Youth Group. Tonight, Metro Police are investigating a discovery outside the headquarters of Indiana Black Expo. An image of a cross appears to have been burned into the grass in front of their east side building. Black Expo staff members say they noticed the burn on the grass outside their headquarters on North Short Ridge Road. However, there used to be a cross on the ground outside of the building when it belonged to Crossroads Bible College. Indiana Black Expo acknowledged that in their statement today, though the group claims the cross had been filled with top soil and grass seed and new tonight RTV6 received a statement from IMPD saying they were unable to make contact with anyone from Indiana Black Expo until today. Police say they are aware of the previous cross but the to err on the side of caution a report was completed. Investigators will be reviewing any available area video and extra patrols have been ordered to the area. Today, fathers from all across the city gathered to share a powerful and positive message. Our Troy Washington talked with the organizer about the message behind the movement. More than 100 black men standing in suits. It's more than a portrait. It's a movement sending a message and setting a standard. We are out here, and not only are we out here, but we want to inspire the, the next generation. There's strength in numbers, and iron sharpens iron, and there's a lot of iron sharpening out here. It's been said a picture is worth a thousand words. So fathers join with their sons, hope their actions speak loudest. Whenever I came, I actually took a loop around the circle on purpose just so I could embrace everything and just be able to see all the men, see all, see all the little boys, to the old men, just to not only inspire others, but also be able to pour into myself. Marvin Smith II took part in the monumental meeting up at the Soldier Sailors Monument of fathers, sons, and black men who before today may not have even known each other but now they forged a brotherhood. To let everyone know that we got each other's backs. Whenever we go into our schools, we, we don't see a lot, of, a lot of black male teachers. We don't see a black male firefighter. We don't see a lot of black male cops. We don't see a lot of black male CEOs. Whenever we're on TV, what we see, we don't see a lot of positive reassuring black males. So today, that's what the whole purpose of everything was, is just to reassure you that. Sean Kimbrough custom makes bow ties. He's in the business of making people look good. Originally, he thought the photo shoot would include a small group with a loud but necessary message to reverse the negative portrayal of black men. 
We're fathers, we're brothers, we're men, we're husbands, you know, we're working men. So I just wanted to know that we are providers to our communities also. At first, the pictures were just going to be posted on Kimbrough's classic Black Men Facebook page. But now he believes a statement like this might just go viral. We're going to flood the Internet with these pictures, positive images of black men. And he still hasn't forgotten the real reason he decided to get everyone together in the first place, to give men a chance to exhale from all the tension the outside world can bring. It just makes me feel so good just to see my brothers come out together and support in unity. Working for you in downtown Troy, Washington, RTV6. Troy, thank you. While some other states are seeing a spike, Indiana's COVID-19 numbers are holding steady and may even be trending downward. Here are the numbers released today by the state health department. 411 new cases were reported. That pushes the state past 42,000 total cases. 19 new deaths were also reported. However, almost all of the, those deaths actually took place earlier this past week. Today, people living in an area the Marion County Public Health Director calls a hot spot for COVID-19 cases had the chance to get tested for free. The drive through site was held at Mount Zion Apostolic Church on East 38th Street. The church reached out to the health department asking to partner with them and bring this pop-up testing site to their community. The church is located in the 46218 zip code, an area the director says is predominantly filled with black families. We talked to Vir Dr. Virginia Kane today about why African Americans Americans have been hit especially hard by the virus. I believe it's because of poverty and sometimes lack of access to health care. So if I don't have insurance, um, if I'm not making a living wage, uh, sometimes people may wait a little bit before they seek out care uh, because of the costs. I'm trying to determine whether I need to pay my rent or put food on my table. So I think that's one major reason. We've had many people in our congregation uh, get sick and people, friends that I know um, have gotten sick and I do believe that it is a pandemic and we have to be careful and practice safety. The pop-up testing site is in addition to three other ongoing testing sites offered by the Marion County Public Health Department. And new this evening, another sign that business is trying to get back to normal following the pandemic. The Hi-Fi in Fountain Square held its first live concert in more than three months. Local soul band Huckleberry Funk was the headliner at the show. The Hi-Fi is only open at 50% capacity right now, so the maximum crowd tonight would be about 200 people. The venue is also requiring everyone to wear a face covering while they are inside. During the pandemic, volunteers are stepping up to help improve the gardens around the Indiana War Memorial Plaza in downtown Indianapolis. So far this season, volunteers have helped plant over 30,000 annuals. Today, members with the November Project, a free fitness movement, helped plant 80 rose bushes. We talked to a woman who has been volunteering at the plaza for the last five years about why help from volunteers right now is so critical. With COVID, they usually use prisoners to help with a lot of the tasks. They're, they're, they're in their last year and they're getting some training here at the War Memorial. So normally they would be a lot doing a lot of the planting or helping with a lot of the planting. They couldn't this year because they're stuck back in prison. We've been helping um, today. We're planting some roses, watering roses, um, just helping weeding, anything they need help with. They've reached out to us a few times and um, we've stepped up and come, showed up. Volunteers say planting flowers at the Indiana War Memorial is a way to still maintain social distancing while also giving back. You can sign up to volunteer at the Indiana War Memorial's Foundation website. There was a lot of hype, but the crowd was quite a bit smaller than expected. Next, a look at what was supposed to be the first big in-person rally of the race for the White House. A rarity in this summer of the coronavirus, a live sports event in the U.S. We'll show you who crossed the finish line first in what was supposed to be the final jewel of the Triple Crown. Todd. And Nicole, as we head into your Father's Day forecast, storm chances are finally returning. In fact, it's raining in some areas already uh, here this evening. The storm chances are with us off and on pretty much throughout our entire Sunday. We'll detail it for you hour by hour using TrueCast coming up in just a few minutes. The head.
This is RTV6 News at 11, working for you. Despite fears that it could lead to COVID-19 spreading, President Trump resumed in-person political rallies tonight in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The crowd on hand appeared to be much smaller than they expected. It did not fill the arena as past rallies have, and an outdoor overflow area was shut down even before the event began. ABC's Karina Mitchell has more. President Trump pressed ahead with a rally in Tulsa even after six members of his advanced team, including two Secret Service agents, tested positive for COVID-19. Also, the number of confirmed cases hit new highs in Tulsa, something the president was quick to downplay. When you, test a, when you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. But what was meant to be a defiant comeback was met with empty seats and a less than enthusiastic reception. However, outside the BOK Center, protesters brought a message of unity. Racial strife, deeply rooted in Oklahoma, going back to the 1921 Tulsa race massacre where white mobs attacked the Greenwood neighborhood, one of the wealthiest black areas in the country, known as Black Wall Street. They murdered residents and destroyed their businesses. Unequivocally, the president is not welcome in Greenwood. But others camped out for days to get a seat at what the president promised would be an unforgettable night before departing the White House. But just hours before the event was to begin, the Trump campaign announced it was canceling its outdoor speech by the president. President Trump blaming radical protesters for the lower turnout. You're pretty on me. The swaths of empty seats caused the campaign to scrap plans for the president to address an overflow space outside the stadium. The warm-up act coming in the form of the vice president. People are going back to work and worship. We're getting back out to stores and restaurants and the great outdoors. The transition to greatness has begun. The city had planned a curfew to keep the peace, but the White House pressured against it. The National Guard on standby as crowds disperse, potentially interacting with police and protesters. Karina Mitchell, ABC News, New York. After refusing to resign, the U.S. attorney in New York has been fired. Attorney General William Barr said President Trump dismissed Jeffrey Berman today. But the president contradicted that statement Saturday, saying he wasn't involved in the decision. Berman served the Southern District of New York, where he investigated several Trump associates. Barr tried to force Berman to resign late last night, but Berman said he had no intention of stepping down. He says he had learned about his supposed resignation from a press release. A ruling today in the case of the United States against former National Security Advisor John Bolton. A judge did not halt publication of Bolton's book against the wishes of President Trump. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimber. D.C. District Judge Royce Lambert ruling on Saturday that former National Security Advisor John Bolton may move forward with publishing his political memoir, The Room Where It Happened, but saying in taking it upon himself to publish his book without securing final approval from national intelligence authorities, Bolton may indeed have caused the country irreparable harm. In a statement to ABC News, Bolton's attorney says, we welcome today's decision, but added they take issue with the preliminary conclusion that Bolton did not comply with his contractual pre-publication obligation to the government. Even though the judge failed to halt the book's release, President Trump taking to Twitter Saturday morning, calling today's ruling a big court win, writing, strong and powerful statements and rulings on money and on breaking classification were made. The president spoke to reporters as he left the White House on his way to his campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I think the judge was very smart and very indignant at what Bolton did. I think it was a great ruling. Judge Lambert strongly indicates Bolton's hopes of keeping profits from the book are endangered, and he could face criminal prosecution for disclosing classified information. ABC's Martha Raddus sat down with Bolton early this week for an exclusive interview. You described the president as erratic, foolish, behaved irrationally, bizarrely. You can't leave him alone for a minute. He saw conspiracies behind rocks and was stunningly uninformed. He couldn't tell the difference between his personal interests and the country's interests. I don't think he's fit for office. I, I don't think he has the competence to carry out the job. There really isn't any guiding principle uh, that I was able to discern other than uh, what's good for Donald Trump's re-election. 
Now, Bolton still faces a civil case brought on by the federal government over his alleged breach of his non-disclosure agreement. Andrew Dimber, ABC News, Washington. Andrew, thank you. It's usually the last race of horse racing's Triple Crown, but during this COVID-19 year, today's Belmont Stakes was the first duel. The race in New York was run without fans due to the pandemic, and the horses were the only ones at Belmont Park not wearing masks. The race ended up being a runaway for the horse Tis the Law. The three-year-old colt from upstate New York charged to the lead, turning to the front stretch and won by four lengths. He can now set his sights on the September 5th Kentucky Derby in October 3rd Preakness. Now for another check of your Storm Team 6 forecast. Meteorologist Todd Klassen standing by. Todd, you're already tracking some storms for tomorrow, but you're starting with some hot temps from today. Uh, yeah, you know, it took till yesterday to get our first 90 degree temperature across central Indiana, Nicole, and now we've done it two days in a row. 91 was the high uh, today in the Circle City, 92 in Bloomington, but Lafayette and Terre Haute and Muncie got all the way up to 94 degrees. So it was a scorcher out there. The humidity throughout the day wasn't all that bad, but it's really come up here this evening. If you haven't stepped out the door yet uh, tonight, you'll notice the difference and certainly you'll notice it tomorrow morning as well. We're running almost uh, an inch and three quarters below where we should be for the month. Well, we're finally going to start to change that here going forward in this forecast over the next couple days as we'll get some needed rainfall. We're sitting in the 70s and 80s right now across the area. And as I mentioned, the humidity has come way up. We're dealing with rain already here in northern portions of central Indiana. Some rain moving through Lafayette as well as the Monticello and Delphi area. And then as we expand out, you can see it's pretty unsettled as you work your way off to our west, really through much of Illinois. Illinois, uh, down into southern Missouri and Arkansas, and all this rain is going to be heading our way at times throughout the overnight hours and then again uh, throughout the daytime hours uh, tomorrow. So your Father's Day is definitely going to be warm and it's definitely going to be very muggy. It's probably not quite as warm as it was yesterday, but with the humidity around, I think it's going to be even a little more uncomfortable than it was today. We're starting off around 70 degrees at 8 a.m. on our way up to high temperatures to tomorrow that will be in the mid 80s. Now throughout the morning hours tomorrow, there could be a hit or miss shower. Certainly a possibility, but it's really throughout the afternoon hours that they become a little more numerous. We get some heavy downpours, some lightning, not expecting severe weather. We're not even in uh, the marginal risk here in central Indiana. There's a little sliver in southern portions of the state that is under the marginal risk. Uh, but just know as we work our way throughout the day tomorrow, if you have plans to be on the golf course with dad or just grilling in the backyard with the family, I uh, would check the radar, use that Storm Shield app, and it'll show you these storms as they start to make their way through our area. As far as the potential rainfall, you know, it's feast or famine. Some of you probably don't even see any rainfall tomorrow, but other areas could pick up close to an inch of rain in some of these heavier downpours. Uh, that's just the way it's going to be, not only tomorrow, but as we get into Monday as well. Once we get to Tuesday, the rain potentially a little more widespread. Uh, but we probably take the thunderstorms out of the equation with the cold front coming through. Then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, plenty of sunshine. Nicole, with temperatures in the lower 80s and the humidity coming down as well. But again, for Father's Day, it's warm and muggy. And be on the lookout for those storms to be off and on throughout much of the afternoon and evening. Todd, thank you. With protests continuing, schools are starting to think about how they will discuss racism with students. Next, we'll look at some of the teaching programs educators will work with this fall. You make the most of it. Complete a free application today. This week, every school district in Marion County committed itself to fighting systemic racism. The 11 school superintendents in the county declared their schools to be no racism zones. Every school in Marion County will display no racism zone signs. Each school district will also review their policies on racism, and they are committing to train employees to make sure they can address racism, harassment, and discrimination in a meaningful way. We will learn, apply, teach anti-racism with urgency and intentionality within our school communities. The result will be educational environments that better reflect and universally benefit the children we serve. Parents will be given a list of resources to help them discuss racism with their students. There will also be resources available for children of every age at the website of each Marion County school.
Calls for racial justice here in central Indiana and across the country are forcing educators to evaluate how they respond to racism. Our partners at Newsy took a look at how school districts are handling these issues before the new school year starts. The national push for racial equality is propelling some school districts to change. One example is Muncie, Indiana Community Schools. Officials there plan to appoint a director of diversity, require implicit bias training for school resource officers, and review the current curriculum. We leave it often to the teachers to be developing their curriculum to teach. And so that's where we believe we can do a little bit better by working to create some lessons or to find books or materials that we would be able to provide to teachers to help when, when they're teaching. In a district of approximately 6,000 students, only about 10% of teachers are people of color. And it's not just Muncie. According to the most recent available data from the 2017-2018 school year, just 7% of the country's public school educators were black. 79% were white. Revamping hiring practices is one of the nine items the Akron, Ohio public schools are working on after the school board recently declared racism a public health crisis. When you talk about hiring practices, you have to go all the way back to the posting. How is the job description written? Um, is there racism latent um, within that job description? Is there racism uh, embedded uh, unintentionally, perhaps, in the way we screen our candidates before they even get out of that pool? But change in education can take time, especially in a system that has struggled to correctly teach black history. That is evident in the public statements many districts have been sharing, where the language used varies from the explicit to the divided. Once all of these um, statements um, have been written and once all of this work has been, this initial work has been done, how is all of this going to be put into place? Um, and I think that that's where the, the bulk uh, of the work really now needs to, to be focused. Amy Morona, Newsy, Washington. You only have one day left to help us put food on the table for Hoosiers who need it. We'll show you an easy way you can help us out all while doing your grocery shopping. Hour or visit onehourheatandair.com. You only have a little bit of time left to help RTV6 in Kroger raise money for second helpings. Through tomorrow, you can round up your grocery bill or select a donation amount when you check out at 46 participating Kroger locations. The money will go directly to second helpings. The nonprofit group specializes in rescuing food that would otherwise go to waste and making sure it gets to those who need it most. RTV6 and the Scripps Howard Foundation will match up to $12,000 in donations. You you can also donate by going to the IndyChannel.com. Todd. All right. Thank you, Nicole. It's going to be a warm and muggy Father's Day with temperatures in the mid 80s. And we will be dodging some showers and storms, especially in the afternoon hours. Not expecting severe weather. More showers and storms on Monday and Tuesday. But once that front goes through, a pretty nice stretch of weather Wednesday, Thursday and Friday with lower humidity, sunshine and temperatures in the 80s. But again, some scattered storms for your Father's Day plans. All right, Todd, thank you, and thank you for joining us. Have a great night.